Hey class, uh, this is our class for November 1st, uh, Intro to Management. Apologies, uh, I won't be in today. I'm feeling a little bit of a sinus infection coming on, so I thought it'd be best to post the class in the evening uh, and have you guys watch it than uh, have me potentially miss class in the morning. So I will pivot to the slides and we'll go through those. Chapter 10 is uh, on entrepreneurial ventures. We'll define entrepreneurship, explain why it's important, explain what entrepreneurs do in the planning process for new ventures, know how to think creatively about solving common problems, develop your skill for writing and uh, an executive summary for effectively communicating novel ideas, describe the six legal forms of organizations and uh, choice of appropriate organizational structure, describe how entrepreneurs lead organizations, and then explain how managers control organizations for growth, downturns, and then also exit. What is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is a process of starting a new business, generally in response to some sort of opportunity. Uh, entrepreneurial venture organizations that pursue opportunities are characterized by innovative practices and have a goal uh, and have growth and profitability as their main goal. Small business, you know, kind of misnomer, right? Uh, generally, small businesses have fewer than 100 employees, but that's a pretty big number, even, even at 100. Uh, doesn't necessarily engage in any new or innovative practices. It has relatively little impact on its industry. So what I'm seeing here change is that some technology companies, because of scale, may employ few human bodies, but not necessarily be a small business. Uh, entrepreneurship versus self-employment. Uh, self-employment is uh, individuals who work for profit or fees in their own business, profession, or trade. An entrepreneur uh, focuses on innovation, uh, startups, job creation, and global entrepreneurship. So if you're, I think what this is saying is that if you're a plumber and you're doing plumbing, you're, you're not necessarily an entrepreneur, you're self-employed. But if you are a plumber who's trying to start a plumbing company uh, or change some of the dynamics within the plumbing business, you know, that would make you an entrepreneur. The entrepreneurial process, explore the entrepreneurial context, identify opportunities and possible competitive advantages. Uh, relating this to kind of what I'm going through, uh, you know, I thought there was an opportunity in wealth management within the fee structure uh, and scale uh, given remote work in COVID. Um, you start the venture and then you manage it. You know, how do you generate revenue? How do you get new business? How do you maintain business? No two entrepreneurs are exactly the same. Generally, they create something new and different, search for, respond to, and exploit changes, uh, research feasibility, and launch and manage new ventures. A study of uh, small companies showed that while 95% uh, said developing a positive reputation, uh, and relationship in communities where they do business is important. 70% admitted that they failed to consider community goals in their business plans. I haven't really, to be honest with you, when I think about community goals, I live in Winchester. I haven't really thought too much about like serving my local market, um, mostly because I'm too focused on uh, acquiring new clients through the web. Uh, identifying environmental opportunities and competitive advantage. So I guess tying that statement you know, traditionally, wealth management has been one that's word of mouth only, or you go to a big brand. Um, but the internet's changed that. I think that's part of the opportunity here. Uh, you know, the competitive advantage is that you can be flexible in this environment. Software, you can now build a wealth management firm with mostly software. Um, so sources of opportunity can be unexpected, unexpected, incongruous, uh, the process need, uh, industry and market structures, demographic changes in perception and new knowledge. So you want to see if this venture is potentially feasible, what do you do? Well, you look at the limitations of what's currently available. You see if new and different approaches can be applied. Have there been advances or breakthroughs? Look at you know electric cars and batteries. Is there an unfilled niche? And then trends and changes within the space. So I won't just read this slide off it to you, but evaluating potential ideas, what might you consider? You know, is the market saturated? Would it be too costly to acquire new business? 
know, these are all things, uh, you know, that you have to consider. Are you willing to work hard? I feel like I'm working longer than I have in the past, um, but maybe that's because I'm capturing all the upside potentially as well. Feasibility study. Uh, so in my business, my, my almost employment acted as a feasibility study, analysis of uh, various aspects of proposed entrepreneurial venture designed to determine feasibility. Like if I can manage wealth and manage clients within a firm, it's a high likelihood I'll be able to scale that and do it on my own. Feasibility study. So a brief description, brief history, information about the economy and trends, current status of the product or service, how you intend to produce it, a complete list of goods or services to be provided, strengths or weaknesses, ease of entry. We talked about this. And then other accounting considerations like a pro forma balance sheet. What do you expect the balance sheet to look like in a year based on your revenue and your cash flows and things of that nature? Uh, management considerations. Have they done this before? Do they have a history of execution? Um, what's the organization design? Is it partnership, corporation, sole proprietorship, staffing requirements? How do they manage inventory? Especially important in this day and age. Uh, production and operations issues, equipment. And then also, how do you identify a target market? I figured out, for me, my, my target market is uh, clients with uh, um, over a million dollars or soon to have over a million. And I'm effect effectively willing to pay probably about $1,000 in client acquisition costs just to meet someone who has a who has a million dollars who might want to work with me because my data suggests that one out of every four meetings I get a client um, that also means that my client acquisition cost for someone you know soup to nuts is I'd probably pay four thousand dollars full in marketing costs for uh, a million dollar client so if anyone's looking for a referral bonus you just let me know shoot me an email um, what are the startup costs this is a business with low overhead or high overhead in all variable costs, where the working capital requirements. Uh, so, you know, wealth management is one in which, you know, there's not a lot of startup costs. Most of it's like you built it up in your head, not a ton of working capital requirements. You probably need to spend about a hundred grand a year in software and marketing costs just to kind of be above water, I'd probably say. So, you know, generally don't need loans. Uh, break even analysis, you know. That means you probably need about $10 million in assets to break even. Is there collateral? Does the business have assets? Credit? And then, you know, legal considerations. You know, is it something where you want to protect yourself against liabilities? You may want to form a corporation. What types of products or services are competitors offering? What are their product strengths and weaknesses? So in my world, a lot of companies investment lineups look pretty generic. And I think that's an opportunity. Uh, how do they handle marketing, pricing, and distribution? So another thing, I think a lot of the marketing in my industry, very generic, right? Hard to distinguish one financial firm from another. I think that's an opportunity. How do they attempt to do differently from other competitors? There's uh, venture capitalists. That's external equity financing provided by professionally managed pools of investor money. So a venture capital firm will invest in a bunch of different high-risk ideas, hoping one turns into a moonshot. Uh, angel investors, uh, they offer ba backing to an entrepreneurial venture in return for equity in that venture. Um, sometimes angel investors will also be uh, investors of passion, meaning you know they like animals, so they invest in animal startups. Um, IPO or initial public offering, that's the first time a company goes public. When they go public, basically they're trading ownership for shares in their company on the public market. Usually when a company IPOs, they don't sell the whole thing. They might only float five or 10% of it. So they get the benefit of the money without giving up the benefit too much of control. Um, possible financing options. So your own resources, that's pretty much what I did you know, a hope and a prayer, you hope clients follow you in my, in my world, right, without actively soliciting them. So once you do that, um, you know, and if decent amount come, you don't really need any external source of financing. Um, could go traditional banks, venture capitalists, angel investors, an IPO really isn't that common 
uh, for startups and entrepreneurs, um, that would be more for a kind of later growth stage company. Um, what about, is there a national or local business development programs? One reason solar is very popular to sell in some areas is because of the incentives some towns, uh, uh, you know, get. And then any unusual sources, to TV shows, competitions, crowdfunding. You should always have a business plan that will document and summarize the business opportunity, articulates it in detail, shows how it will be exploited, and then has the data to back it up alongside it. That will include executive summary, the analysis, the opportunity, what's the context, description of the business, the big one, financial data and projections. So depending on the business, you know, that can be pretty tough. It became clear after about 30 to 45 days, somewhere about $35 million of assets um, was going to come over, which means probably about 275 grand in revenue. Um, I know my, my fixed costs for software are 65K a year. So for me, it was pretty easy to come up with a business plan. And then I know marketing dollars, for every dollar I spend on marketing, I usually get $2 in annual reoccurring revenue. So, you know, the only cap on my marketing dollars is my, my physical time. I'd probably max out my time by spending 50K a year. I'd probably have to do three physical meetings a week with new people, forget about existing. Um, and then supporting document, documentation. Is there any other research on this space or similar business? So sharing economy has gotten pretty big, Airbnb, Uber. Really, it's not even the sharing economy. It's, it's really organizing a disorganized market is where there's an opportunity. Sole proprietorship is one of the primary forms of uh, organization. That's basically just you. You know, you're taxed. Uh, your, your profits are your income, effectively. You're also personally liable. Then you have a partnership. You have more than one person to share in the rewards and the risk, but you also get diluted. The next one I'd focus on is corporation. And that protects the owners from personal liability, but it also adds a second layer of taxes. The slides don't mention that here. Why do you get paid a second layer of taxes? Or why do you pay a second layer of taxes? It's because when you uh, make money as a firm, you're taxed uh, on your income. And then when you distribute the income in the form of dividends, that's also taxed to the end investor. Won't focus too much on these, but you know an LLC is fairly common, a form of legal ownership that's a hybrid between a partnership and a corporation. This gives you a great summary of some of these different forms of business organization. I won't read through this, but the slides are up there. I would certainly flip through these. Design structure. Organizations design decisionally decisions and entrepreneurial decisions revolve around six key elements, work specialization, departmentalization, chain of command, who do you report to, span of control. If you're the boss, how many people are under you? Do you have a small team or a big team? Centralization or decentralization. I have seen trends that say process orient, oriented jobs tend to have wide spans of management and centralization. You're doing a process, repetitive. Sales roles, on the other hand, tend to have a decentralized process. Are you hitting your numbers? Good, that's all we care about. How formal is all these things? Um, human resource management, how do you recruit people? How do you handle retention? So, you know, one of the things in, in my industry is that the firm usually owns the clients and the advisor gets a percentage of revenue. But that's on paper, the firm owns the clients. Most of the time, the advisor is the one who owns the clients and the firm is providing a resource. So my idea for business model is really to take it one more step further and basically almost act as a software as a service for other wealth managers. Now, normally, if I were to recruit another wealth manager, I'd have to give them a huge bonus check, et cetera. But under my business model, I give them instead a super high payout and complete ownership of their book of business. They can use me for my services to surround their wealth management practice with, but if they want to sell their book to someone else, they're free to do that as well. 
initiating change. If changes are needed in the entrepreneurial venture, often it's the entrepreneur who first recognizes this and acts as a catalyst and coach. Um, the importance of uh, continuing innovation. Innovation is a key characteristic of entrepreneurial ventures. And in fact, it's what makes the entrepreneurial venture entrepreneurial. So generally you have to be proactive. You're not someone who's going to bed early and getting up late, you know, uh, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, unless you have some really kind of sweet gig going on. Maybe you're an influencer and you only work two hours a day. Employee empowerment, giving employees the power to make decisions and take actions on their own. So, you know, as you get bigger, you have to give people empowerment, right? I mean, it's one of the things I'm having a hard time with right now uh, is, you know, training an assistant to be onboarded to help me out because I feel like we're still in that crucial phase where I have to get everything onboarded because I have to know about it. And if I don't know about it, then it can slip through the cracks. Leading the venture, uh, leading employee work teams, uh, planning for growth. So do you expand your capacity? Do you expand your staff? Do you shrink it? Do you move it? Um, there have been many companies who, you know, aren't good at growing, right? They couldn't handle the growth. Um, and then the process breaks down or it loses quality or it loses staff. Uh, growth oriented culture, keep lines of communication open. Establish uh, trust by being honest, be a good listener, be willing to delegate duties, be flexible, reinforce the contributions of each person, continually train employees, maintain focus, uh, and establish and reinforce we, because you want other people to buy into your idea. And if you don't get buy-in, your employees are just workers and you'll have higher turnover. Um, boiled frog phenomenon to perspective on recognized performance declines that suggest watching out for subtly declining situations. So if someone gets a little bit worse every day, you might not notice compared to someone who uh, dramatically reduces their performance. So be on the eye for that. Harvesting, that's exiting a venture when the entrepreneur hopes to capitalize on the investment. Maybe a bigger firm is willing to buy it. So like an exit for me potentially is, you know, uh, maybe at some point, I sell a percentage of the firm to another larger organization. You know, that's something that's fairly common in this business. You get a liquid, liquidity event or you get bigger and you start acquiring other people. How do you value the business? So right now in the stock market, I think the average company sells for about 20 times its annual profit this year. So different sectors, different industries, um, you know, that valuation metric will change. Um, but it's also a helpful, helpful guideline. Like if I wanted, if I had a client who owned an, like one or two appliance stores, I could just look at the valuation for Home Depot. And let's say Home Depot sells for 15 times profits. And I might say, all right, well, if they sell for 15 times profits. The smaller appliance store must sell for something around that as a starting point. And that's the end of this chapter for 10. So um, sorry I was able to, had to miss class today, guys. I was just worried about how I was going to feel in the morning. Um, so hope you guys had a great weekend. And I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday.